Yeah, so I'm, actually, I'm not going to put it in presentation mode because I, I really want you to see what I'm doing. And I want you to see that everything we've done today can be done by you. You don't need loads of software. You don't need to do loads of things. It's actually not very time consuming. And by doing very little things, you can achieve a lot. So I hope this is not very repetitive and it's not very easy for some of you and that even though it, it might be something you already know, it'd be good to refresh that. So I'm gonna talk about colors, about alignment, about fonts and about what really we are doing with design. So first I'd like to tell you that please do not think that design is something you don't know. So we see design everywhere these days and you might not know why you like something, but you certainly know why you like whether you like it or not you know whether it's pleasant or not because you keep reading you keep there and you stay there you click so you actually know what you like and that actually matters a lot because we're not talking about art here we're talking about design and making things functional so really keep things simple and always remember about why you're doing that so the first thing is about colors Colors might be a bit of a tricky thing to pick. Usually you think, oh, wow, what color should I use this for this? Um, is it something uh, playful? Well, it's not that difficult for us, for an organization. We should keep it simple and use our branding. It's there for something. And we shouldn't think about much colors and um, different combinations and use loads of them. So really keep it simple, just remember that. The other thing I'd like to say is that you shouldn't be afraid of using dark colors. So it's, this is especially important for the background. We tend to put always white backgrounds and everything, and this is great when you have loads of information, you've got a diagram all over the place, because when something is crowded and is trying to tell you quite a complex information, it's better to keep the background simple. But if you have one message like this one right now, something dark actually helps a lot. And there are many studies telling you that whenever you have a dark background, your peripheric view just focuses on one thing. Otherwise our eyes are going everywhere. This helps the audience, whoever is reading an newsletter, whoever is reading, um, I don't know, a banner or even a slide like this right now, it just helps that person to direct their eyes towards the middle or whatever word or image that you have. So don't be afraid of the dark backgrounds. Then going back to the colors and how many colors you should pick, really with two colors, you can do so much. So pick one color, let's say the blue and a yellow or an orange as Elixir does. And then with a white and a gray, you really can do loads of things. And with all these combinations, you can create so many different things that um, can be used for so many different scenarios. They're not gonna look the same every time. And then the other thing is that to remember that the accent color is usually the more vibrant color should be used not all the time. You should be very careful about this. Give it a functionality. So why are you picking that accent color for that particular heading? Should that be on the heading? Should I use it on the links? So this is again to emphasize that this already gives a quite different feeling just by changing the background and you're using exactly the same colors. Then the next thing is again about remembering purpose contrast and accessibility. So you're using different colors, but are they um, visible? So if we use right here, a blue, probably that's not gonna bring much. So really you should think, why am I picking a different color here? This is because you wanna tell, for example, that this is where the tip is. So let's use the orange or yellow for that. And you might not know how to do this exactly. And you might even have colorblind people looking at your slides and you can't really know if this happens to be a good color or not. So there's loads of resources free out there that you can use. So for example, colors is a really cool one. So you can actually go here and just start playing with colors. You can match your color here for your branding. Let's say that this is our blue. It's not this, but let's, let's say that this is the elixir blue and we need to pair it with something else so we can change. If you press the space bar, you can just flip all the other colors and see whatever combination works. You can also see if this is color blindness friendly. You can even use different types of filters with different types of color blindness. So you're sure that if you're giving a purpose to that color, let's say in a graph, or let's say that you want to make a link visible as we do in newsletters, you're sure that even a colorblind people will recognize the color, especially when it has functionality. And again, you can use all the resources like Adobe or this one that is for contrast. Let's say that you want to see if the button has a 
enough contrast for your website. You can also check it here. And then finally, the second point is alignment, space and distribution. This is something we've talked with the use cases a lot. So this is probably the thing that everyone fails to do. Most of us fail, but it's just not time consuming at all. It's very easy and it achieves a lot. So the first thing about this is the margins. So this is something we tend to forget, especially if we have very busy slides, for example. We say, oh, this title here that is in the master template, it, it, I don't really like it there because I need to put more things here. And then we change it. But really we should ask ourselves, should I change that or should I change the content? Am I putting too many things? Because the title is there for a reason. And this is again for consistency, looking for that familiar feeling, that familiar, um, feeling that something is in the same place, so you know the heading is there. So if I flick from this to this, you can see that it stays the same and your eyes go straight away to the title. If I change the position, you lose that completely. And that's so powerful to keep someone, for example, in slide deck, aware that that's the same title we are changing sections. And this is something we've done in this presentation as well. And then about distribution and alignment. This is um, an example of having a text and then a set of images. So someone has tried to align this little images, it could be logos, it could be pictures of people, but they're not quite there. You, you want this, you don't want this. So this is something that Google Slides has, that, that PowerPoint has, Illustrator, whatever you're using, and it just distributes whatever you have in one line. Let's say that we want to have everything between this one in the left and this one in the right, completely distributed with the same space between them. We'll just go here, try and distribute, and they magically align. <laughs> it's just beautiful how easy it is, and it's not time consuming at all, and it makes a big impact. So really, if we keep the margins and we align those boxes, that's already a lot that we are achieving. And it looks neat, it looks more professional. It looks like you, you spend a lot of time on it, and really you haven't. So again, this is a screenshot of how you can find the same thing in PowerPoint and really everywhere. If you're not sure where to find it, just click help and type a line and distribute. This is usually what I do in Google Slides because I can't find anything. So just use that, it's quite useful. And if we move to the newsletter again, something that Erin had already talked about. So how we, space that content out and this is again very easy you just create a template you keep to that template you stick to it and you use it repeatedly so people are familiar to it so the first thing is create those two separate clear sections so you can see straight away that this is section one and this is section two there's no doubt about that they're clear headings as well they are bigger than the rest but they're not different colors because the colors we're using them for the links so this is something that as Erin has said it's always at the bottom, but it's got a color, it's got purpose. We're not using the yellow or the orange for anything else. If I use the orange in the title, then I might confuse my users. Is that a link? Is that not a link? Why are you using the color there? So then we're going back to that, the purpose, why do you use the colors and what function do they have? And then finally, the blank spaces. So <laughs> this is something that I see many times. Um, people tend to just add spaces, thinking that's the easy way. But actually, it's better if you use different spaces between the paragraph. If you have a look here, there are different spaces, and the different spaces are there for a reason. One is to separate the sections. Another one is to separate the headings from the actual body of the text. And they are different sizes because they picked here in the add more spaces up and down. And this is very useful, especially if you're creating a template. You only have to worry about that once. And after that, everything you create will have exactly the same filling, will look exactly the same. That's especially useful for a newsletter. If you do a bit of um, work at the side, then that pays off in the future. So just uh, remember not to add loads of spaces and instead think about how much space you want to separate those sections and create those blank spaces that are so useful. And then finally, it's about justifying. So something that I see a lot, I'm not sorry, not about space and justifying, is that people tend to justify all text. Uh, we think that this is more organized, but actually sometimes it screams, this is something that we haven't thought through a lot, because especially if you use it for the web or for a newsletter, you have to think that this is gonna appear in a different device like this, or it might appear like this. And this changes completely the way 
people are reading things. So again, we need to think about functionality. It might not look as pretty as having everything justified and perfectly fitting in your space, but it's much more functional to have it not justified just because your eyes well, will go through the text much easily and read every paragraph much, much easily like that. So don't justify. <laughs> And then the fonts and typeface. I wanted to give a bit of background here because we often are a bit confused about what's a font and what's a typeface. So the typeface is a um, set of different fonts. Let's say Corbel, which is Elixir font and typeface. So the typeface is Corbel. But when we say font for a specific title is because we're setting the font for a heading that is Corbel, it's bold and it's 14. So that is a heading. So really you only have to use one typeface for one document. You don't have to put different types of fonts and mix them up. It's quite complicated to go for that perfect combination. So if you're not sure, just use the same typeface and use a heading and then just make it smaller, but using exactly the same. And you achieve that same feeling that it's just a heading and a body, but just using the same typeface. Now, if you want to go a bit farther away and you want to experiment a bit with those headings with different fonts, you should be aware that if you're going to pick a different font, a different typeface, you should do it for a purpose again. So maybe you want to make a title a bit more attractive. Okay, then don't use two typefaces that look exactly the same. So Roboto and Open Sans, for example, are very similar. Really, you can't tell the difference. So why not keep it the same? But if you change it a bit, if you make it this title a bit more attractive with this EXO2, for example, there's a completely free font on Google, you achieve that. And if you want to do something a bit more fancy, just remember that sans serif and serif font usually does the trick. This means fonts that don't have any decorations like Corbel, or fonts that do have decorations like Times in Roman. So actually Times in Roman fits quite nicely if you printing something, it's easier to read. And if you pair it with a more modern font per title, it just works. In any case, if you don't want to end up with a Comic Sans and a Times New Roman, what you should do to be um, in the safe side is just use, again, resources that are there available for you. So Typewolf or FontJoy, they're very useful. So FontJoy, for example, you can just create different backgrounds, you can put it in dark, you can put it in light, you can know straight away how it will look in your document. And you don't have to think, the machine is going to do it for yourself. So you can pick yours, for example. So let's say we want to have open sans and you want to have more contrast, less contrast, it will pair directly whatever fits better for your case. So just use the resources you have out there. And then finally, the last point is that design is always about content. Content is the main thing. So what Erin has described is the, your key roadmap. Once you decide about the content, once you carefully decided if something has to be out of the picture, then you go into design. You don't put design first. It's always content, the first thing. Design should be your content. So this is the clear example of the problem we had before. Our researcher was determined to use a PDF, determined to use a one page, and determined to use a set of colors. And because the content was not tailored for that design, it didn't work. So first we thought about the content what is important. And then we thought, well, maybe the idea that I had a one page, I have to ditch it and I have to pick two pages instead. So just, it's, it's a very clear thing, it's a very clear tip, but go first for your content and then try to look for a design that fits your content and your purpose. So really always think about the functionality. Again, design is not about making things super pretty, but actually making things useful and functional and that fit the purpose that you have. And other than this, we'll just um, left you some links and resources of things that we talked about today, about newsletters, mailing lists, um, not just in Elixir, but in the wider science communication community in Europe or even abroad. They're very interesting. Um, you can learn a lot about software as well and, and tips for design. There's really one newsletter for everything you want. And free courses um, about data visualization. So some of the things we've did we did today, maybe you, you couldn't have thought about them because you've never seen them. So what you can do is just have a look at what other people are doing. And that certainly helps your creativity because if you don't know that something is possible, you're never gonna repeat that. 
And again, some more readings about accessibility, about how you write in the web. Oh, sorry, I don't know why it's moving. <laughs> but um, you've got loads of resources here. So um, the first thing I wanted to show is the animations that some of you were talking. So really using After Effects with Final Cut, all this software is not reasonable for someone that might do it once every two months. You're not gonna learn software that takes a year to learn just for one thing. We are science communicators, we're not designers or animators. So one thing you can use is the web resources that give you that, for example, how wing is one of them, but there are loads out there that are free for certain things. You can store loads of files, but if you want to have one thing, do it, download it, and then reuse it without keeping it in the cloud. That's your place to go. It's really useful. It's got templates and very easy animations you can put on social media. It's incredibly useful. But again, if you want to do more research and find other resources similar to this, there's, there's loads out there in the market growing every day. But if you want to do it straight away with PowerPoint, whatever you have, um, I'm going to share now PowerPoint with you so you can have a look at how to do it. It will only take you really a couple of minutes, if I'm honest, as long as you do something simple. So let's say that we are creating a webinar, a banner, but we want to do something a bit more flashy just because we are trying to drive someone's attention. We want to create an animation, so really we just want things to move from point A to point B. That's all an animation is, so this is what different software like After Effects does. But what you can do with PowerPoint is exactly the same. Um, don't try Google Slides, this is not going to work with Google Slides, so please go to PowerPoint. So let's say we have a text that is going to say, um, I don't know, something like join for the webinar. Or even this workshop, let's, let's do something for this workshop. Um, let's try a bit of a more fancy one. Well, let's try Corbell. Let's, let's keep to what we've been saying to keep the company branding in place. So let's make this a bit bigger. Right, and then we duplicate those slides. Like several of them. Let's say we'd say register. Let's say learn, for example. Again, you can change this. This is just to show you how to do an animation. Um, engage. Okay, so we've got something that is going to change from join, register, learn, engage. Let's make it a bit more fancy if you want to add something else. Let's say that this same bubble that we've got here, we're going to make it smaller. And we're going to use this. So it moves from this point, so I don't know, farther down in this one, we're going backwards now. And this is gonna go here, for example. And then finally, this is gonna go here. So if we have a look at this, this is now moving. Now we've got an animation, something looks more like an animation. The only problem we've got here is that animations that go in circles need to be symmetric, so the first, slide should be exactly the same as the last slide that you've got. So let's place this circle in the very middle of it. And then the last one in the middle of it as well. Maybe add one here, that we can say exactly what we are talking about and miss that. So let's say if we're talking about this Converge workshop. Converge workshop. Um, there you go. So we put it there. It's in the middle, it's just that. This is your message, you want people to register. So we've got now more of something that looks like an animation, right? We can even add some color. I don't know, let's say we add any of the colors that are here by defect. So this is gonna be yellow, this is gonna be um, red, and this one here, going to be, I don't know, purple. So now one thing that Google Slide doesn't have and PowerPoint does, and that's why I'm asking you to use this and not something else as well, is a very cool transition, some of you might know, that it's called Morph. This automatically creates animations for yourself. So if you have a shape in one slide and you have exactly the same shape in your slide, the animation will move this point to this point seamlessly without you animating anything. It's really useful. So really gonna put this one here actually. So if I play this, 
Now the dot is moving. The dot keeps moving now. And now it keeps moving up and up and it, it just, it works. It looks like I've done a lot, but really I've done nothing. So maybe it goes a bit slow. Let's say we want to make it a bit faster for a GIF. Um, so we can go here and make it move by itself. And then let's say it's going to take less than a second to move. Let's try it. Maybe that's a bit too fast. <laughs> Action. Here we go. Right. So that looks quite a lot like it already. Um, maybe we can make it even a bit less than that. But not that. So not one second. Let's say the. We put less than that, 50. Right, so now maybe the other thing we need to do now is create something that looks like a square. So just create something that is same item width. And this looks more like a GIF if it works. There you go. So the only thing we need to do now is export it in a format that makes it all work together. So if we now export this, let's say create a GIF. Uh, and he made a GIF. And we put it in the desktop, in the comms workshop. This is only if you want to make it um, be a bit better quality, but I suggest you don't pick really high quality because then the image is going to be too large and it's going to be hard to share it. So if we export this, this is actually going to be animated already. And there you go. You can put this on slides, you can put this in a document, you can put it in social media, really everywhere. And it works. It's an old format, but a format that works everywhere. And as you've seen, it's just so easy to do as long as you know how to do it. Right, I hope that was useful. Um, I've got some other tips and tricks, but if you have any questions throughout while I'm sharing this software, just please shout, um, interrupt me whenever you want. So um, the other thing I wanted to show today is the map thing. So I know that some of you were talking about, okay, where do you get this map? So there's this free website that's called Maps SVG. So SVG is the vector file. Vector files are those files that it doesn't matter whether you make it big, whether you make it smaller, they're always going to be the same amount of pixels because they're not pixels. So it's always going to be perfect. The other good thing about this is that you can color those images as much as you want. It's like working on Illustrator if you've worked with Illustrator. So you just can pick a country and color that country. So let's say I want to take, I don't know, let's say Romania. It's something that is quite hard to find if you go to Google. We download it. And then the other good thing of using PowerPoint and not Google Slides is that you keep that editable format. If you do this on Google Slides, it will pixelate it all. So I recommend you that if you want to create Google Slides with this, you go to PowerPoint and then you just run that to Google Slides. But if you do it once, you have it there forever. See, so once you do this, just drop that inside your PowerPoint. You just convert to shape. And this is all of a sudden just a bunch of little pieces of a map that you can just completely color differently. Let's say you want something just an outline. There you go. And you want to have these region in a different color because you're talking about that region. You've got it there. Really, in that page, you've got every single map that you can think of. So um, we'll be distributing all these resources as well after the workshop. So you have it all in one place and you don't lose it. But really, if you are working on a project that has to put different partners across a map, this is your resource. It just looks so sleek and you've done nothing with it. And um, then finally, a few other ones um, for newsletters and also for social media. So this is um, an alternative to MailChimp. If you're already using MailChimp, forget about using something else. But if you want to use a new newsletter that is GDPR compliant, which MailChimp is not, and that it's free, this is really good. It's based in the EU and the pricing is completely free as long as you don't have 2,000 
500 subscribers. I don't think anyone here is going to reach that. Maybe I'm wrong, but it will be quite hard to reach it. Either way, the pro account is much cheaper than MailChimp. So if your audience is growing a lot in the future, you can do that. Also, if you ever change your mind, they make it quite easy for you to transfer all your data to another platform. So if you haven't picked a platform yet, this is the one. It's so easy. There's got so many templates and <laughs> MailChimp is a bit more complicated if you're learning. So have a look if you're thinking about a newsletter. This is at least the one I would recommend, but there are loads of things out there that you can also explore. MailChimp is not the one thing the, that's the only resource you should be using. It also has quite a lot of analytics. Other platforms also have analytics. So have a look. You might find something quite surprising. And then finally, about something we discussed yesterday about social media. Um, I know that Hootsuite and all these resources are very expensive, um, especially for a small team, maybe even less than a person team. So you might not be thinking of this, but having a social media management tool can make your life way easier. You can schedule the same post about something that's going to happen later on in the year in one day, and it will go out repeatedly without you paying attention to it other than one day. You can even have a look at the analytics. You'll get a report out of it. And you can even connect your analytics from Google, in this case, for Eclincher. Again, there's so many out there, but they're very pricey. So this one actually is quite affordable in comparison to others, and it's got a lot. But if um, you want to go to something even um, less expensive than that, we are currently using Loomly. And although the analytics are not very good, it does allow you to have two users and multiple accounts, multiple calendars, and at least this to us something that we both know and myself and we think they're quite useful again you pay a little bit but you don't pay 200 dollars a month as you do with hootsuite or with similar resources